Okay, before we get started, I have to ask, who here has fallen through the ice while snowmobiling on a first date? Put up your hand <laughs> if, you, if you've fallen through the... No, no? it's just me? Oh. That's a bad uh, date. <laughs> well then. <laughs> There's more to that story. Here we go. Maybe I need to be a bit... Hello everyone, thank you all for joining us. I'm Scott Montague from Coquitlam Search and Rescue, and I'll be keeping our technology tanks topped up this evening. I've got some good news for you. If you stick around to the end of our session, you'll get a bit of a freebie from our sponsor, FatMap. Your cameras and mics are off for this session, but we still want to hear your comments and questions. On your screen is a question mark button or a question box. Use it to post anything you want to tell us or ask a question and we'll either answer the online or in the Q&A part of our presentation. In fact, actually, let's give it a shot right now. Go over to that question mark box and type in where you're joining us from. So if you're joining us from, uh, I don't know, Swahili? That's a, that's a language. You're not gonna join us from a language. If you're gonna join us from Zimbabwe, put it in Zimbabwe, we'd love to know. What? <clears throat> While you're doing that, to get us started, please welcome the Executive Director of Adventure Smart in BC, our reigning monarch of SAR prevention in education, none other than Sandra Riches. Wow, that sounds a bit crazy, but thanks, Scott. I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate the introduction. Uh, we have so much to talk about tonight, and most of it is not from me, thankfully. Uh, you get to hear me next week when we deliver our Backcountry Snow Safety Program. Tonight is all about snowmobiling safety and, and how that happens. And Julianne is our guest. She'll come on shortly. But first, I wanted to share a little bit of information about us and what we do. And uh, Julianne's going to share that screen. If she could go full screen, that would be awesome. And we'll just poke through a few things that we like to share through BC Adventure Smart. You might have seen it in a social post already. If you've joined any of our previous webinars before tonight, you may have heard it, but friendly reminders don't hurt. Thanks, awesome, Julianne, that's perfect. Uh, we have you till eight. Toss your questions over there, Scott's gonna help us. And I'm really honored tonight to be joining you um, with two of the 2,600 in total. BC Search and Rescue volunteers. Scott is with Coquitlam Search and Rescue, well-versed in SAR response, excellent tech savvy, thank goodness for his support behind the scenes and in front. And Julianne is also with um, Castle Gar Search and Rescue. So really honored to have both of you here and hear your insights. So let's go to the next slide and I'll just go over a few things that are our regular messaging. Uh, a little bit about me. I've been with the program since 2004 and uh, before that I was a BC Park Ranger and work closely and for the BC Search and Rescue Association. And that's who started the Adventure Smart program. Um, we're in our 19th year now. Our main message, no matter where you go in British Columbia or throughout Canada, the program is national. Uh, you're gonna hear about our 3T message. And this is what we call our trifecta of safety. It's really the foundation of what we want and ask you to do and encourage you to do, remind you to do before you head out there. And it equips you with ideas on how to handle an emergency. Trip planning is that first T. Planning your adventure. Tonight's all about snowmobiling. Julianne's going to elaborate on that. We have an Adventure Smart Trip Plan app that can help you do it. Leaving all of that information at home with friends and family or emergency contact 
who you've had this discussion with, they have an important role to play in case you don't return on time, who to phone, when, and what to share. All that information is left. It could be on a sticky note, pen and paper works, uh, a text to a friend, trailhead selfie, the more detail, the better. Uh, and the app makes it easy. You just fill in the fields, email or text it to a friend. We can share that with you shortly. The second T is training. During the winter time, avalanche skills training is incredibly important. If you spend time in the backcountry during the winter time, uh, first aid, um, risk management, um, mentorship or certification-based training is, is really what we want you to focus on for the activity and the season you play in. And then taking those essentials with you, uh, always big or small adventure, and then add to it season and sport specific. For more details on that, head over to adventuresmart.ca, check out the three T's page uh, link there, and uh, you can check out more about that. Next slide, please. There's the app. We all know what to do with our phones. Take your camera, go over that QR code. It will take you directly to the Adventure Smart Trip Plan app. It's available to anyone in Canada. If you're outside of Canada, pen and paper will work for you to file your trip plan. Uh, and you can access that. It's free of charge to anyone in the country. And it's really simple to use. It's a tool, one of the many, that we offer here at Adventure Smart uh, throughout the province of BC and the rest of Canada. Next. One of my favorite sections of what we talk about, no matter the season, no matter the event we share in person or virtually, is what to do in an emergency. Uh, Julianne's going to fill your ear and with so much information tonight about how to sled safely. Um, but we know that in British Columbia, on an annual basis, um, during the COVID times, it was a little over 2,000 times a year there were search and rescue calls. We're trending back to pre-COVID statistics. We're at about just under 1,700 now uh, and so that's that's great accidents happen we know that based on the statistics what to do in an emergency is often confusing for some or uh, enthusiasts just aren't aware we have the stop analogy for the children we have a program it's called hug a tree and survive the same premise applied to adults is stopping thinking observing and then planning when you're in a safe location and when you know you need help and you've called Staying put is key. One quick story. Recently, about a week ago, Central Okanagan Search and Rescue were searching for um, subjects uh, and they called in, left their coordinates, and then they moved. That didn't bode well for search and rescue. It, it added time and effort for them to find them. It all ended well. Subjects were out uh, 12 hours later, but them moving made it more difficult for search and rescue. The stop analogy is a really good, easy one to remember. Next. The number for search and rescue via dispatch of 911, then police or RCMP is calling 911 and asking for police. Um, I have close relations with all of the 78 search and rescue groups, friends and feels like family of all the search and rescue volunteers. Two of them are here tonight. I can't phone them directly if I get in trouble. I and everyone else needs to phone that 911. It's the same number we were taught when we were little, fire, any type of emergency. Uh, and share your details. This is what your emergency contact would have to know as well. So when you have that conversation with that person and leaving that information on the trip plan, they need to know that this is the number. Thanks, next. And there's no charge for rescue. There's no charge for search and rescue in the province of British Columbia. So don't let that be a part of your decision if you should phone. If you need help, phone as soon as possible. Don't delay. Don't wait a few hours and then it gets darker, colder, incidents gets more severe. Phone right away and know that you won't be charged. There'll be no charge to you. There, there's a cost, of course, to search and rescue. That charge is not um, charged to you. There's, there's no fee for you to pay. Uh, for more information on that, there's a great statement by the BC Search and Rescue Association on their website. Uh, and there's that link there, bcsaro.com. No charge for SAR. Next. We have a wealth of information. Um, Adventure Smart went national based on our provincial success. We're into our 19th year in British Columbia. It went national in 2009. I work closely and for the BC Search and Rescue Association, and we have an outdoor education page that is full of events. Tonight's one of them. Uh, we have a few more, uh, four more to get through the winter. 
And then we have trail specific safety videos for a lot of hiking enthusiasts in the summer, spring and fall. And then we have a library of events. So every webinar we've ever delivered or special event online, we've collected that and that's easy for you to watch too on demand. And that's at bcsara.com outdoor education. Next. And here comes the show. So I was here to talk to you a little bit about our messaging and, and help remind you or introduce you to Adventure Smart, but Julianne's the show and I'd like to introduce her. She started riding as a child at the cottage um, uh, and got into mountain riding about 17 years ago. She rides because it brings her to the most beautiful places and it's always an adventure of the unknown and known because she's an excellent planner uh, and it keeps a big smile on her face which she does have a beautiful one. Snowmobiling has become a way of life for her. She shaped her life around it and admires anyone who loves the sport as much as she does or would love to get into it. Her plans for the future include um, continuing to grow what she has as, as a wonderful business. She shreds mountain adventures uh, right through North America and, and it really fulfills her. She's bilingual in French and English. Uh, tonight's English presentation or else I would be out in left field. Uh, she's a full-time mama to Jackson in her free time. Uh, she rides mountain bikes. Uh, we should go for a ride one day, Julianne. Uh, wow. Horses and surfs. And she's also a, um, an operations level two certified um, avalanche technician. That's another wonderful um, notch in her belt. So Julianne, the stage is yours and welcome. And it's great to have you back. We've got her returning. She came last year and is so glad to have her back tonight. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, very honored to be back here. You guys do such an amazing job at just helping spread knowledge and education to the public and recreationalists for every season, every sport. And uh, yeah, you're a big help for search and rescue as well. Just um, trying to get those call out numbers down, which is great. Um, yeah, we, I, I absolutely love search and rescue. It's one of those uh, things that I definitely, um, can't leave basically it's uh it, it's a, such a good group of people it puts us through such amazing certifications and just being there to help everybody in the public it's something that uh very honored to do so yeah welcome thank or thanks for having me i mean um i'm here to talk to you guys about being ready for backcountry mountain snowmobiling um yeah it's mountain snowmobiling is a serious thing it's uh very physically demanding uh, it encounters lots of things outside the box of just snowmobiling that you need to um, take into consideration such as you know avalanche education first aid education um knowing how to make your plans you know all that kind of stuff so that's what i'm here to talk to you guys about so Julie. As we get going, would you mind turning on your uh, webcam? Oh, so we oh can see. yeah, totally. Let me just figure out how to do that. <laughs> uh, right under that green microphone. Yeah, there it is. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Scott, for uh, for that. The tech master behind the scenes here, guys. He's got us. He's got our back. <laughs> um, so yeah, talking about uh, pre-sled trip planning, um, everything that you should do before even considering, or as you're getting into the sport, I should say, not before you're considering getting into the sport, because you're going to need your snowbill to get this education or a lot of the education, anyways. Um, so yeah, AST one and AST two. Uh, is definitely two things that you should definitely get as a recreationalist. Uh, there's lots of online tutorials with uh, avalanche.ca. Um, and then if you're one of those recreationalists that gets out like 80 to 100 days a year, I'd highly suggest um, you getting your Canadian Avalanche Association Operations Level 1. Uh, it allows you to kind of understand the snow a little bit more. It allows you to get that extra education that you need for being in the backcountry for so many days in the season. Um, so yeah, that's basically what it comes to for avalanche education. And then obviously getting that mentorship with people that um, have higher certifications than you and that know a little bit more than you and learning from the people that have been in the industry for a long time is definitely a perk. Uh, wilderness first aid, a minimum of a 40 hour course is, is definitely highly suggested. Um, and the reason why wilderness is because sure you can have your OFA level three or, you know, some, some other high, 
um, class, I guess, certification, but you take those, um, you take the knowledge from those courses and you get thrown into the wilderness without all of the easily accessible stuff. Um, and you almost become a little bit useless because you don't really know how to, um, let's say, make a splint without the SAM splints or the, you know, back brace that you have easily accessible on the first floor of your building or, you know, you got to improvise and make things um, out of stuff that you have like sticks and stones pretty much and yeah rope and all that kind of stuff so yeah wilderness first aid is definitely um highly suggested mapping in a navigation course um allowing you to understand how to read terrain before going into it because very often when we go into the mountains the visibility is not good or you know there's a big snowstorm or something like that and so you should know where those avalanche paths are before you go into the backcountry and learn where north south east west is and you know the the google earth is such an amazing tool and we're going to go into it just briefly um later on but yeah taking a mapping or navigation course will help you tremendously in making making your trip planning um, a success. Um, taking a weather course is great. I mean, you can always pop up the weather on weather.ca or whatever, but being able to look at, you know, satellites and the imagery that changes over every hour and knowing where the winds are coming from and where they're pushing all the snow and all that kind of stuff is really, really beneficial with your planning of your, of your time in the backcountry as well. So yeah, taking a weather course. Um, outdoor survival, um, I mean, there's not very many courses being offered uh, under that title, but there's lots of online stuff that you can look into on how to build a Quincy or how to build a fire and have a heat repelling shield pushing the heat into you and, and you know, there's lots of, of tips online. So get lots of outdoor survival um, tips before going out there and exposing yourself. Um, learn how to set up a landing zone for a helicopter um, during an emergency call. I'm actually the next slide we're going to go over that. So, uh, being on search and rescue, I've seen lots of um, uh, I wouldn't call them disasters, but like having loose items floating around and and then getting sucked into the rotors as the helicopter is coming in for landing, or having trouble finding the group that needs help. Yeah, sure, we have your GPS location, but in very busy areas like you know Whistler, Revelstoke, Valmont, Golden you have tons of snowmobilers on the mountain within that close proximity of the um, GPS coordinates. And so I'm going to give you guys a tip later on, 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 on how to make it a little bit more efficient for search and rescue coming in. Um, learn sled mechanics and learn how to extract your snowmobile if it does break down or if you, I mean, this year so far it's been a very low tide year with the snowpack and so the rocks and the stumps and stuff are quite exposed. So learning how to fix your machine or being able to take it out of the backcountry if you completely mangle your front end and, you know, things like that. Learn, learn how to do those things before exposing yourself in the really far backcountry. Um, learn about wildlife encounters and respecting the, for say, caribou closures. Um, not so much on the coast, but more so in the interior. Uh, we have a lot of caribou closures and a lot more, um, I wouldn't say more wildlife, it's just different wildlife than the coast, I guess, if you would say. But yeah, we have closures and um, there's a website called uh, Snowmobile Selkirks um, that lets you know where the caribou closures are and they have mapping that you can download into your GPS to make sure that you're not going into the caribou closures and um, a whole bunch of stuff. So yeah, learn about that. Supporting your local snowmobile club with um, a local membership where all, every single snowmobile club in British Columbia is a not-for-profit organization and they are um, working volunteers um, to make snowmobiling amazing for everybody. So whether it's uh, buying a membership or paying your trail fees, it all goes towards, you know, grooming, the cost of the groomer, the cost of cabin maintenance. Um, and yeah, they fight to keep recreational snowmobiling alive for uh for us so more strength in numbers as memberships go with the british columbia snowmobile federation um helps us as recreationalists because we get to keep our recreational areas we keep hearing more and more um recreational areas closing down so yeah strength in numbers um, so here I'm going to talk quickly about a helicopter landing zone. Um, you definitely want it a minimum 120 feet by 120 feet flat uh, area and a square um, as best as possible. You always want to be um, making this landing zone downwind from the patient um, just because when a helicopter comes in, 
um, they like to land downwind first of all as a, as a pilot and second of all it just makes less debris flying everywhere if there's lots of wind onto the patient. Um, you want to make sure that it's in an open area with no trees or close slopes or if you're down in the valley you want to make sure that there's no um, like telephone lines or, or hydro poles you know that kind of stuff. You want to make sure that all loose uh, sub, uh, loose items are secured, so like toques and gloves and light things that can fly up into the rotors. You want to make sure that that stuff is all secured and made sure that it doesn't go flying into the rotors. Um, flip all their sleds on the side. So this little picture that you guys see on the right hand side here, this is what it looks like from a helicopter. Um, obviously a helicopter wouldn't be coming in and landing here because there's too many trees, but think about um, if you're in a really busy zone and sure they have your GPS coordinates, but they're really trying to zone in on the group that needs help. If everybody in that group would put their snowmobile on their side, so you would have a side profile of the snowmobile facing up to the helicopter, then that helps search and rescue really distinguish quickly what group um, needs help. So yeah, think about that uh, when you are calling in for help, how you place your snowmobiles around the patient, that will um, make landing a lot quicker. Uh, you want to communicate with the pilot on the radio, so um, very often with search and rescue when you're making calls, say for on your inReach or your Zolio, uh, they'll let you know what channel to, uh, to communicate with, uh, with the pilot um, when search and rescue is coming in. So just make sure that you're um, communicating with them, let them know, hey, the sleds are all on the sides, this is our group that needs help, and uh, yeah, communicate uh, through there. Stay far away from um, <clears throat> the rear rotors of the helicopter, so you you're never approaching a helicopter. Um, very often when a helicopter lands with search and rescue, uh, we don't expect any of the public to start walking towards the helicopter. The people in the helicopter will come out first, but if by any chance, you know, you just want to let everybody know, do not approach the helicopter. And if you do have to approach the helicopter, um, come in from the front at only when the pilot gives signal to do so. So you'll watch them and then they'll kind of wave you over if you need to go. Um, okay, I'm going to share a little uh, video with you guys about uh, snowmobile safety gear and what you guys should be bringing. This is a video I made like seven years ago, so it's a little bit outdated, um, but I'm going to share it with you and just fill you in on some changes at the end of the video. We've always been told to be safe, to play safe. But what does that mean in the backcountry, deep in the mountains, in a winter environment? For me, it means everyone gets to go home at the end of the day. We are gripped by the draw of the experience as we explore the vast playgrounds around us. The temptation of powder snow can feel exceptionally strong at times, the closer you get to it. It's great to follow our desires, but we must remember we are responsible for our own actions. When I head out, I ask myself, does this adventure have 100% of my attention? Have I thought of all the details? Safety means being prepared, and being prepared means being aware of the situations we get ourselves into. More than likely, it's going to be a surprise when adversity strikes. The more we practice our backcountry skills and prepare ourselves, the better we are able to react to the unexpected challenges that come our way. The goal of this episode is to encourage thinking about backcountry safety. How capable and prepared are we? How capable and prepared are the people we ride with? In this day and age of increased connectedness, it can be too easy to feel not far away from home as we head out into our backcountry zones. The reality is, it doesn't take long to get out far. We left Pembe, we drove 35 approximately kilometers up the valley. We lost cell phone range at 20k on our way up. We've unloaded and we've got another 25 something k to go on the Forest Service Road. quickly you can get here on your own. I also think it's important to not forget the inherent challenge of terrain 
and distance covered it took to get here. And I'm about to lay out all my essential gear for backcountry survival and safety. So on the table in front of me, I've got my complete kit that I bring into the backcountry with me every day. I've got my tools and ropes, I've got my medical and survival kits, I've got my communication, and then I've got my avalanche gear. I personally have a wilderness first aid certification, and it's just as important to have the stuff as well as know how to use your stuff. This is a great prepackaged first aid kit that Mountain Sweater Snowmobile Magazine puts together. It's a deluxe 71 piece kit. It includes pretty much everything you need to fix up minor injuries in backcountry. The reason why I carry a couple of bivy sacks is just because it has multi-uses to it. It's basically a thin material that's waterproof, uh, heat shield, and it's durable. So you can build shelters, keep yourself warm in it, multi-uses for it. This is a great pre-packaged survival kit by Survive Outdoors Logger. It includes everything for you to make a shelter, build a fire, and signal rescuers. These are gels and chews and they're great survival items, but they're also really good items to give you that extra boost when you need to get back to the truck after a super deep stuck vest kind of day. This is my fix-it kit. In this kit I carry things like a wood saw to either get kindling for a fire or to cut a tree down to get yourself unstuck. I carry the tools that are essential for general fixings or adjustments on sleds. This is an air shock pump because I rock air shocks from Fox and it doesn't hurt to carry spare parts. A couple essentials are zap straps and a couple different kinds of tape. I carry a couple of different ropes as far as lengths and strengths. Examples of use of rope is if you need to tow your buddy's sled out. I carry three different types of communication devices. I've got a sat phone, I've got an inReach, and I've got radio. I carry the Iridium sat phone, 9555 is the model. This thing's awesome because you can actually call for help or call people that you need to communicate with and let them know exactly what you need in the back of the sheet. The inReach is really good um, to text message and email uh, 160 character uh, messages to people just to let them know, you know, what is going on and, and you know, if you're going to be late because you're stuck or, you know, don't, don't send out help, we're all good, you know, kind of thing. Yes, it has an SOS button, but the search and rescue does not know what they are rescuing to. Are they rescuing to a hurt body or are they rescuing to somebody who is lost in the backcountry? They, they won't know what to bring you. Uh, another cool thing about the inReach is that it can track you throughout the, um, throughout the day and people can watch you travel through the backcountry online if, uh, if need be, which is really rad. So I carry a good radio with an external mic just for easy access that's attached to my backpack. With this setup, I find that I use it a lot more uh, just because it's so easy access. It allows me to keep tabs on the group as we're traveling through the backcountry and it also allows me to notify the group behind me if we're punching trail into zone to either go left or right because left is a no-no zone. This is my Abbey kit and snow science tools. I am certified operations level one and working slowly towards my operations level two. And I uh, teach AST1s uh, every year, snowmobile specific. My avalanche safety gear consists of my transceiver, my probe, my shovel, and my airbag. I carry snow science tools because I'm constantly observing snow and digging pits. It's important as a guide to log everything you have in your information book, just to be able to look back on it and make sure that you're making safe decisions. All this gear is essential when you're going out snowmobiling in the backcountry, but by far the most important thing is to know how to use it all properly. Being prepared means equipping yourself with the right gear and skills essential to backcountry survival and problem solving. Perfect. So as I mentioned, um, that video was made uh, like seven years ago. And so there's a couple of things that I'm going to just add on top of that video. Um, as far as the inReach goes, Search and Rescue does um, know what to bring you because they're communicating with you when you make a call. So or when you make a SOS call and you're texting. Um, so, yeah, inReach is great. Um, the, the downfall about sat phones is, you know, you're in this world that's orbiting. And when you're the when the Earth 
loses its connection to that satellite uh, when you're making a call, the call gets dropped. So um, this day and age, I almost think that the inReach is a little bit better uh, just because it's a consistent line of communication and you're not getting dropped and having to call back and you know time is, is missing kind of thing. And uh, there's also a new device that just came out recently that runs on Iridium satellites as well, and that is the um, Zolio. Uh, so that's another really good one. Um, as far as like the new iPhone coming out, um, I wouldn't really depend on that uh, for emergency communication device. They run on satellites that are uh, not as dependable as the Iridium satellites um, in in North America or like in, in BC, I'd say, because I don't really actually know uh, for the rest of the world. But I know for BC, um, it's not super dependable. So if you're going out in the backcountry and your only means of communication with the outside world is your iPhone, uh, I wouldn't fully depend on it, even this new iPhone 14 or whatever. Um, another thing about I that I want to mention um, with the first aid gear, I mean, that's my like recreational little first aid stuff. I've got um, a lot more in my tunnel bag uh, and I've got a lot more in my truck. Uh, so I carry like full on vac mat in my truck. I have vac mat um, for limbs. So smaller vac mat stuff. I've got oxygen tank. I've got toboggan. Um, enough stuff to do my own rescue if search and rescue is not able to come and get me or come and help basically. Um, my main goal is to get my patient out as soon as possible to comfort. Um, so yeah, I have all the gear as well in my truck um, when I travel. But as a recreationalist, everything that you saw on that screen is definitely a necessity. Having something to deal with major bleeds too is, is something that you should have, like a tourniquet and like some sort of quick clot pad or something like that definitely worth um, getting and uh, yeah uh, in your survival gear just make sure I know I didn't mention this in the video but make sure you have multiple ways to start fires um, just having one uh, lighter and all of a sudden you drop it in the snow you're kind of screwed so yeah I have waterproof matches I have flints I have three lighters I have multiple ways because in when you're stuck in the in a winter environment in the backcountry you need to stay warm you need to have food and you need to stay dry and you need to drink water so those are the four essentials that you should definitely um, be able to have or keep warm and to stay alive. Um, one other thing I, I didn't mention in the video is having a light. So sure your snowmobile has a light on it, but if you're stuck in the backcountry at night and you're trying to get out or you're lost, when your snowmobile goes up a slope, your headlight is pointing up to the sky. Um, so being able to see where you're going is not going to happen at that at that point. So I carry, um, it's a local company from Nelson here called Lynx OGT. Uh, they produce amazing headlights. Lots of search and rescue crews have them. Um, and just for this seminar and everybody watching, they are offering a 10% discount um, with the code BC10. So that's lowercase b, lowercase c, and 10. Um, on linksogt.com, L-Y-N-X-O-G-T.com, and that discount is good for uh, one week. And the cool thing about their lights is that they have a little mount that you could put on your um, chin of your snowmobile, and, or of your helmet, I mean, and it shines. Uh, you can hook the headlight, headlamp up to that, and um, you can see where you're going as you're driving on your snowmobile and they're rechargeable too which is really nice being able to plug them in and not have to change batteries um so yeah oh and i'm an operations level two certified now i know in the video i said i was working towards um my certification and i've finally gotten it over many years so i'm just going to continue sharing you guys um the powerpoint um group dynamics so uh that's another big thing with snowmobiling and staying safe in the backcountry riding with the same crew versus riding with a different crew or different people all the time i'm going to talk briefly about that when you start to ride with the same crew you start to really know how everybody operates within the crew and uh, how everybody communicates and you also know you know everybody's level of certification when it comes to trusting them to dig you out if something's going to happen or trusting trusting them to help you in a first aid scenario if you get hurt um, you know that kind of stuff so obviously when you first are trying to find your group to continuously ride with you're going over these things you know you're making sure that everybody that you're riding with has some sort of 
knowledge on to fix first aids or like to to fix you if you get hurt. Um, you want to make sure everybody knows how to use their avalanche gear. You want to make sure that they're you know safe people that take into consideration. Let's say you're at a lower ability level um, rider in your on the snowmobile and they're better. You don't want to go riding with them if they're constantly dragging you into the weeds or dropping into gnarly stuff and like not able to get out and so and so yeah you you tend to find your group and you tend to stick with it which is probably the smartest way to go. Um, but we all like to meet new friends and go out with different crews and so if that's the case then just make sure you have that talk with them um, before make sure you know somebody in the group has a satellite communication device make sure everybody has a functioning radio so you can speak within each other within your group um, you know have these conversations making plans with them knowing what kind of snowmobile they they have knowing their ability you know that kind of stuff it all makes you um, able to line yourself up for success for a good trip in the backcountry basically um, reviewing land as a group um, in Google Earth before going out uh, into your expedition. Um, you're able to see the land and it allows you to answer questions such as does it meet the group's riding abilities? Are there any danger spots? It allows you to make a plan A and a plan B. It allows you to see the decision making spots. It allows you to kind of figure out the turnaround spot and around what time. Um, the whole buddy system is definitely huge too uh, when you're considering your, your crew. Um, you want to make sure that you have somebody you can rely on within, let's let's say your group of seven or eight. You know, you're not you, you want to make sure that, that at least one buddy in that in that group is your you're keeping eyes on them, basically. It's hard to keep eyes on eight people on the mountain, um, but when you have one person to keep an eye on and all of a sudden that person goes around the bend and all of a sudden there's, their snowmobile flips on top of them and they're stuck underneath it, you they want you to be there to help them and vice versa. So having that buddy is great. Um, energy check-ins and performance um, based on that. So, you know, as when the day starts, everyone has fresh energy and everyone's all gung-ho, good to go. And then let's say it's a super steep, deep day and everybody gets stuck and all of a sudden one o'clock comes around, you're past your turnaround point, you're pretty far in the back country. Um, you need to start thinking, you know, where is my energy sitting? Do I have it in me to perform 100% to be able to get out of here? You know, that kind of stuff. So that's that, that's definitely something big to take into consideration. So I'm just going to share um, another screen here with you guys. And it is Google Earth. Give me one second. I just need to pop it up. And I'm going to give you guys a little kind of example, scenario of, of what I am talking about here. So I'm just going to share this screen. Um, I'm going to just Google um, something close to me here. Uh, there we go. Okay, so you Google your snowmobile area, whether it's, you know, Brandywine in, on the coast or uh, Boulder Mountain and Revelstoke, and it really allows you to give you a kind of good look on, on what the terrain looks like. So this is a parking lot right here. Then you have a road that goes up the valley and we're looking like it's like deep, dark trees. So we're below tree line here. And here we are, we're gonna start to climb um, into tree line. You can see the trees are starting to get a little bit lighter. Uh, you're starting to see a little bit more cut blocks, you know, things like that. Um, and so here is, hold on a second, I'm just gonna change the view so you guys can see kind of head on as you're coming into the area. Okay, let me just move it over a little bit. Whoops, like this. Okay, so this is the Forest Service Road, and then, <clears throat> and then the Forest Service Road ends. Oops, ends right about here. Now, if you look to the left here, we have a massive face. This is called Ladybird Face. And um, there's usually a single track that kind of goes through here. And you're going through the whole avalanche path right here. You can see the avalanche path because you can see the trees. They kind of disperse, like you got thick trees right here, and then you got no thick trees here. You got a bunch of rock here, and then you got thick trees again, and then you got a big avalanche path right here. You can see the avalanches have taken out all the trees. And then, anyways, 
long story short, the cabin is over here and then you got big mountain stuff in the back. So if I was making a plan and I had never been here before, I'd follow the service, forest service road up, um, up the valley and then I'd say, hey, when we reach right about here, I think this is a pretty big decision making point. Um, if I'm observing shooting cracks and woomph like sounds on the way up, if I have uh, visuals of old avalanche debris or even new avalanche debris, I should say, um, as I'm going up the Forest Service Road and I get to this point and I, and I know that there's this massive face right here, this is going to be a deciding point saying, hey, We've had lots of red flags pop out at us about, you know, avalanche active snow um, moving. I don't think it's smart for us to go to the cabin today because we have to expose ourselves in this terrain trap. It's a, it's a gully that kind of goes, that basically captures all the snow down here. It, it, do, it doesn't have room to fan back up here. And so you're exposing yourself to this, some pretty high risk going through here to get to the cabin. So this would be my decision-making point number one. Uh, you know, if it's a low um, hazard day and I'm not um, seeing any sort of movement in the snow, then maybe sure it is safe to pass. Not putting every single group expo everybody in the group exposed all at the same time. I'd probably pass one at a time, regroup in safe thick trees, and radio everybody. Say, hey, I'm in the safe trees. The next person can come regroup and then same thing one at a time pass if it's a low hazard day if you're seeing a bunch of red flags this is a decision making point saying hey nope this is not a safe zone i think i'm going to go back and play in this cut block right here where it's a little bit safer and uh maybe i'll play in the trees over here where it's a little bit safer so yeah basically that's my um that's my little Google Earth uh, analogy of, of of making your plan and making your trip plan and stuff like that. It really, really helps you um, with being successful and reading the terrain before you get into it and making a plan. Um, so yeah, next is discussing the plan and the goal based on the avalanche forecast. So when you check avalanche.ca, you're going to check the weather as well. Um, I'm a big fan of windy.com uh, to look at weather and the, the weather model, the NAM weather model is the best one to look at for, for mountains um, if you're looking at that one. And uh, it allows you to see like freezing levels and allows you to see how much precip is, is coming and it's pretty it's pretty accurate. So it's good. Um, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, everybody's on the same page with the group riding ability and the fitness of everyone. Um, you want to take into consideration these things because, you know, let's say you have somebody who's not fit and it's their first time going snowmobiling. You don't want to bring them into a gnarly zone where they're just going to gas out by 9 a.m. and not be able to go anywhere because then the whole group has to suffer. You know, you're digging that, that person out all day or, you know, that person is feeling really bad for keeping the group back, you know, that kind of stuff. So take that in consideration um, you also want to take into consideration the sleds involved uh, you know if you have a bunch of people with brand new snowmobiles really good riders and they all have turbos and then you have somebody who's a newer rider that has you know an 07 rev and it, don't get me wrong it's a great snowmobile but it might have a little bit more chances of a mechanical failure you know that kind of stuff so yeah I'm I'm not going to share the screen about weather just because we're running out of time but um, basically I was going to go over a couple of weather different weather models and stuff like that and then last but not least um, you want to discuss human factors. So, for example, um, the, 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 the most recent one that happened, uh, I was teaching an avalanche course last weekend, and one of the persons that's mentoring with us right now uh, with She Shreds Mountain Adventures, he, um, his dog took off first thing in the morning, and so he was late coming in, and so he was a little bit pressured to drive a little bit faster to get to the parking lot, and he had a bit of a, a crash, I guess. Not, not a crash, he basically slipped slid out around a corner and went over onto a snowbank and he was able to get out in four low but he was a little shook up you know he gets to the parking lot and, and he says listen I just want to let you know that I had this happen to me on on the way here so my mind is a little bit um out of the ball game uh I'm a little bit stressed you know I was said I said don't worry thank you very much for letting me know um I'll definitely be keeping an eye on you and, and just making sure that your your head is in, in the right space as we're moving through the backcountry and stuff like that. So yeah, human factors is huge. Um, it affects somebody's thinking ability. And uh, yeah, you definitely want to, um, you definitely want to make sure you talk about that stuff. 
Um, next slide. So in the end, um, our main goal is to reach your destination at the end of the day after a solid day of backcountry hoonin with your buddies. And that destination is home. So if you are being a diligent recreationalist on your snowmobile and taking into consideration these things, um, I'm going to read you two stats here <clears throat> from the BC Saras um, that happened last winter. So these are stats from last winter. Uh, snowbill incidents were among the top SAR rest, rescue type in British Columbia. Uh, in this order, sledding was number one, hiking was number two, and skiing was number three. And the top reasons for BC SAR um, replying to, to emergency callouts is injury. Uh, and the second one is lost or disoriented. And the number three is exceeding abilities. So an example of exceeding abilities is, you know, if you see a track and you say, ooh, this track looks fun to follow. And then all of a sudden you start getting sucked down deep, deep, deep into steep tree terrain. And then you realize, oh my goodness, I don't have the ability to get out of here. So that's an example of that. So if you as a recreationalist do your due diligence to become a safe sledder, we as snowmobilers can be safe users users of our beautiful backcountry and reduce the amount of call outs for our volunteers at search and rescue. Thank you very much for listening to me, you guys. I believe so I'm going to hand it over to Sandra. She has a couple of other things she wants to let you know. Actually, I have a couple of questions that have come in. Oh, uh, yeah. I was wondering if you'd be able to take them. Uh, first off, um, what, I was wondering, how often do you change your plans? Like, you get get out there and you end up doing that. Can you give, give me an example of when you may have actually changed your plans and why you did it? Absolutely. Um, so the most recent actually was to, uh, our last warming. So just a couple of weeks ago, um, we had a plan to to go out into the backcountry and, and punch into, I really like to look at Google Earth and um, just kind of go with the whim in places that I've never been. And and so, yeah, we looked at the Google Earth one the night before and we said, hey, let's make this our final destination. Um, we took into account, obviously, the avalanche forecast for the day and the weather and all that but as we were tra traveling through the backcountry we were noticing um, lots of signs of instability so places where we would regroup um, having two or three more snowmobiles we'd feel that woomp that crack settlement of the um, bad layers that were under us and so that was red flags we were noticing um, shooting cracks along the forest service road going along like just small slopes and stuff and we were testing small slopes and convex rolls on our way up and they were moving and so yeah we didn't make it to our destination we decided we did we decided as a group not to um not to go because it was too dangerous and my level of risk has lowered quite a bit um since having a kid actually and so there were there's people with higher levels of risk and there's people with lower levels of risk and so yeah talking about it within your group is is um is smart just so everyone's kind of on the same page and you don't feel bad for calling you're the only one calling quits because you're the only one in the group that has a low risk tolerance or whatever but yeah it happens quite a bit it's not something that um I, it is something I take quite seriously uh, I don't let it get to me um, to say hey I had this in mind and I've worked really hard to get here and we're going you know it's safety first and I, I don't want to die so yeah it happens a lot that's fair <laughs> it happens a lot. I should say it happens a lot when the conditions are dangerous it doesn't happen very often when the conditions are um stable and and that kind of stuff i should that's what so I should the later say. in the season the more you should be having sort of a a, a, a secondary option as another thing that you might want to do instead kind of yeah it's all it's all season long like right now it's 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 happening now because there's so much instability in the snowpack and then in the later season like in the springtime when the spring diurnal happens and it starts to warm up uh, in the in midday, like stuff does move when when snow warms up, so it happens all the time. Mm. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, sticking with the st same group, and you've mentioned that a few times throughout. Uh, but there are some people who are uh, on this call who maybe do meetups, uh, and I think there might even be a person or two who might do something solo. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? How can we reduce the risk uh, when it comes to uh, um, either uh, meeting up with people out at the trailhead who you've never sledded with before or going by yourself? 
Yeah, so um, meeting up with people that you have never gone out with before, totally cool. I mean, I love meeting new people, but I definitely make make sure that um, everybody's on the same page. That they, I don't, I don't personally go out with anybody that has no avalanche training. I want to make sure that they at least know how to use their transceiver, probe, and shovel. Um, if anything is were to happen to me, I want to make sure that they can dig me out, or at least get to me in a timely fashion. Um, but yeah, making sure that they have the certification is huge. Making sure that they have the gear when you're going out with different crews. Like if you have all the gear, like your, the satellite communication device, you want to make sure they have a radio. If you have all the gear, then, um, you at least want to tell them, you know, say, Hey, I have all this gear. What do you guys have? Just to make sure that everybody knows who has what and that all your parameters are covered um, when it comes to the essentials. Everybody should have their own survival kit uh, and food and water. You're not um, going to start packing all the food and the water for everybody in your group. Um, but yeah, there's there's certain things that you are responsible for. And if you're riding with a bunch of different people all the time, it's it's one of those things that you should talk about before leaving the trailhead. Um, and then riding alone, I don't suggest. It's so, there's so many levels of risk. Um, snowmobiling, you know, you just go by accidentally off the road and the snowmobile flips on top of you and you're you're stuck. Like you, you're in a tree well and who's going to help you? Uh, who's going to help you if an avalanche um, happens? You know, if you're solo, there's so much ri more risk that you're taking that it's it's not smart. I don't suggest it. Yeah, it just it, it because you you your risk goes up so much more because in it like you might be fully prepared, right? You might have all that stuff, uh, but if you can't get to it because you're the one injured, pretty useless, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. Tina wanted to know what uh, uh, type of headlamp you were mentioning. Lynx headlamp, which which is the specific model that you use? Yeah, um, there, he's got some really rad models. Um, I have four different kinds. <laughs> every time you can get You're a Ashley aficionado too, are you? I, I have tons yeah, of right? ones. <laughs> every time he comes out with a new one, I'm like, ooh, that one's brighter. And so I always get the most <laughs> brightest one. And they're, they're so bright. It, uh, it lights up like a whole massive area. And yeah, so yeah, Lynx OGT, L-Y-N-X, and then O-G-T. Um, as an abbreviation and dot com is the website and uh, yeah you get whatever model suits you for what you do obviously if you need a big peripheral you got to get the one with the most il illuminance or I forget the name of the word but lumens illuminance uh, I forget lumens is correct yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah you get the one with the biggest lumen um, it, it all depends on your budget too I think that his most expensive one is like 160 bucks and then his least expensive one is under 100 bucks so and then you got the mount um, it's like it goes over the mouthpiece of the helmet and uh, it just click clicks into the helmet and so yeah okay. it's really really easy to put on because it's kind of hard to put a headlamp on with a helmet visor and stuff like that so he's got this cool little mount that you can get that's extra but yeah the discount code is bc10 and it's valid for a week and i put it in the chat already so you, oh, you can okay. copy it from there perfect um we're running out of runway here sandra uh i think we did we want to do a quick poll yeah let's do the poll you read my mind i wanted to see um if anyone had any inkling of uh, the answers to our questions. We just got one here, but which area of the province has the most search and rescue calls by snowmobilers? And, and, and you know, seasonally we have user groups that ask for search and rescue for help a little bit more than others, just based on the season and that number of, of users that do that activity. So in the summertime, as you try to pick your answers there, you've got Vancouver Island, Northern, BC, Sea to Sky, Kootenays, Sunshine Coast. Uh, in the summertime, we know it's hikers on the South Coast. Big numbers, big population, right up easy access towards the Sea to Sky corridor, throughout the valley, up towards Pemby, uh, Julianne's old stomping grounds. And so that's that's an easy equation to think, oh, it would be hikers. But we're curious if you have any idea what, what it is here for the winter time uh, that has the most calls, what region you think that would be. And we've got Sea to Sky at 25%. Okay, that's pretty high. And then Kootenays at 66 um, and Northern BC at 900. The East Kootenays is it. There's no question. Um, we spent some time trying to increase awareness a little bit more in that region. 
have guests come on like Julianne to help us spread the love provincially. And I see out of province visitors. Uh, so that's exciting for everyone who's not from BC tonight. Thank you. But spending time to educate people in that area or who are going to that area through our partners, um, affiliates, tourism, BC Snowmobile Federation, Let's Ride BC, BC Search and Rescue Association, uh, tourism reps, Revelstoke Search and Rescue, Golden District, and Search and Rescue. Those are the two user groups, pardon me, the two SAR groups that would be affected mostly in that region. Uh, but that, that ban, that corridor in there, is a popular region to go sledding and uh, it's a busy time for, for snowmobile incidents for search and rescue. So the more we can be prepared on a whole, but note that region is a little bit higher call volume. Um, it's a great spot to go and play in the snow. <laughs> There's no question about that. Uh, so thanks for playing that. Julianne, thank you. That was awesome. Love the Google scenario. I love that you gave an example of kind of turning around, changing your plans on the fly. And we talk about sound judgment a lot. And when can people, when should they? Uh, and we support that they can and, and should change their mind out there, depending on the snowpack. This winter is a unique one, right? Uh, depending on weather, depending on group dynamics, you talk about energy check-ins. I love that. I'm going to use that for sure. And and that these are key things to incorporate into. And, you know, so many people make plans of, okay, we're going to sled the first weekend of February. This is it. We've taken time off work. We're going to go. We're packed. Groceries are packed we're just stoked right stoke is high people come from other areas you make a plan you get there maybe that equation changes a little bit that sound judgment sound judgment is key you know maybe it's a turnaround on the trail that morning three quarters of the way in uh or you, you change it completely um totally. and i the love best, that you incorporate so the go ahead best, the best part about that though is if you have to do a turnaround or if your plan a doesn't come through the people that you ride with um should make up for that kind of bummer decision um because then you can still have fun together so it's good oh yeah there's always something fun to do after that there's no question about it and and you hit the nail on the head when we talk about destination and that's always home so the peak or that summit is only halfway right it's only halfway that's 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 the turnaround point we still have to come down and oh, and get out and get homes so the destination is home no question about it thanks for offering the discount to links love it and everyone who stuck around to the end tonight uh does get one month free trial from fat map and scott can toss that into the chat as well send us your questions send us any information you might have wanted to learn a little bit more about tonight we stay in touch with julianne and we can connect you to her um we're all pretty pretty quick at getting back on our socials so i know that you're as good at that as i am julianne so that's fun if anybody has questions if you want to join us again next week um we have our backcountry snow safety which is all about the three t's and what to do in an emergency in detail tonight was just a skirt of it all we get into that in in, in major detail uh, so thanks to everyone who joined us tonight scott thanks again for joining us uh, as tech support julianne it's great to see you again all the best throughout the rest of the season keep up the good work out there Thanks and for having uh, me. my pleasure. And uh, thanks again, Scott. It's always a pleasure. And thanks to everyone who joined us. We're going to sign off now. And thanks for taking the time to get informed and helping us reduce the number and severity of search and rescue calls for the province of BC. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, folks.